Good evening, everybody. I'm Jack McCorkle, the Executive Director for the Office of Alumni Relations. <clears throat> On behalf of our office, welcome to part two of Northeastern Circuit's program, Breaking Down the Business of Professional Sports. Tonight, we're going to focus on sports marketing. I'd like to acknowledge the community members with us tonight, alumni, students, parents, staff, and friends. Thank you for being here. It's great to see the Northeastern community continue to thrive, especially through programs like this one. <clears throat> uh, this week is Global Entrepreneurship Week here at Northeastern, and to kick it off, our office launched the Alumni Entrepreneurs Directory. This directory was created to showcase a selection of business ventures owned and operated by Northeastern alumni. Please go to the benefits section of our website to check it out. Riding an incredible wave of momentum, Northeastern has grown to become a world-class institution focused on research and experiential learning. The Office of Alumni Relations has also evolved by offering lifelong learning opportunities through a variety of programs. One of those is Northeastern Circus. Launched in 2015, Circuits provides with an opportunity to stay connected with the Northeastern community through an industry-specific events and professional program. We have one of those programs for you tonight with an impressive and diverse panel that will share their insights on the business of pro sports marketing. The Office of Alumni Relations, thanks, thanks you for being here tonight. Allow me to introduce our moderator, Tracy DeForge, and share a little bit about her experience. After earning her Juris Doctorate at Seton Hall University, she worked for the National Hockey League, Major League Baseball Advanced Media, and was a partner in a venture investment firm focused on companies that intersected sports, technology, and media entertainment. In 2010, Tracy started the Boston chapter of Women in Sports Events, also known as WISE, a nonprofit, a nonprofit providing a platform of invaluable resources for professional women in the sports industry. An attorney by training, an entrepreneur in spirit, and an executive leader through experience, her career has focused for more than a decade on startup companies and sports media technology. Most recently, Tracy helped bring a mobile SaaS company from concept to Series A funding and has been starting, growing, and selling companies for over 15 years. Tracy's a mother of two, a six-time marathon finisher, and a first-degree black belt in Taekwondo. True, be careful. Yep. <laughs> Please join me in wel welcoming our moderator, Tracy DeForge. Thank you, Jack. I'm very excited to be here tonight, and especially amongst the talent that we have here. Um, I appreciate you inviting me to be part of this. Um, I just want to do one little plug for WISE, the Women in Sports and Events Network that we started here in Boston about six years ago. It's a national organization that really is about empowering women in this industry, male-dominated industry. And uh, just so if you want to know more about it, if you have young girls that you know that are interested in this industry, we encourage you to send them over to the WISE Boston webpage. Love that. So, but without any more of that, I'll introduce you to our great panel tonight. Um, we have Troop Parkinson, the EVP of Partnerships from the Red Sox. He's been with them for about, uh, well, many years, since 2002, holding many roles during that period of time. Sean Sullivan, the CMO of the Celtics. Uh, he's in his 21st season there. Adam Grossman, the CMO of the Red Sox and Fenway Sports Management. He's been with them since 2002 with a small uh, three years, uh, the Miami Dolphins in between. We've got Matt Chmura, the VP of Marketing Communications from the Bruins. Um, he's in his 11th season there with a stint with, at NFL and MLS prior to. So we'll get started here with our questions. Um, guys, how do marketing strategies for the sports industry in Boston differ from the strategies employed in other cities or other industries? <coughs> Thinking about our town. Grossman, Grossman. I've worked in multiple you. cities. <laughs> See, Troop and I already worked it out. We're just going to give every, That's every right. question to Adam. And just so we're all clear, so, so Adam, I've worked with Adam since 2002, and he did leave for three years, but he left on his own. He wasn't fired. Just so you're, <laughs> in case you're curious, he, he should be on this panel. Um, he's very aware of it. Go ahead, Adam. But you do have to question uh, leaving the Red Sox for the 
for the Dolphins. Uh, on, on, I left that out. I le- he's very smart. I left that out. <laughs> on your own volition. Um, the, just my, my experience um, was sort of night and day as it relates to the Boston market versus Miami. Uh, just the complexity of the fan base that's in Miami. Um, competing with the beach is not something that is, uh, is, is quite challenging. Um, but one of the things, it was funny, when I first got to Miami, I remember walking around and I saw more Red Sox hats than Dolphins hats. And I said, oh, man, this is going to be tough. Um, but the other thing for us, especially in the NFL, where you have so few games, um, we won 20 games in, three, in the three seasons that I was there. And, you know, we could win 20 games in a month and, at, the, at the Red Sox. And so sort of just the, the rhythms of how many games, you know, what that core fan base is. I was told people like in in Boston if something happens you know if someone just pulls a hamstring someone in Bangor Maine is going to be crying um, immediately <laughs> if you go in Miami where the stadium situated I mean you could go a mile and they may not know have any feel or any connection to the Miami Dolphins the football team so the the the, the makeup of the community the makeup of the fan base said the the number of games uh is it's technically the sports industry, but they're entirely different businesses, and the relationships also with the teams and the leagues would, would also differ immensely um, as sort of the makeup. I'm sure Matt can. Yeah, Matt, would in. you agree with that? What's your? Yeah, I would. I think that the the Boston hockey fan in particular is some of the most knowledgeable and authentic fans that there are. I, I think that our fans know more about the game than than most fans do in other cities, and I'm sure that's true with most of you. Um, uh, so the, it's it's you can't fool them. You can't you can't pull the wool over their eyes, so to speak, uh, in our market. I think, which is which separates us from most markets. I think. For what we do, we can't be in a better spot yeah. than Absol- Boston. Agreed. Absolutely. You know the the thing I'd add on that is, you know, I think the the one, you know, one of the great things about working in Boston, and you know, um, you know, I'm a fan of the the respective teams and the Patriots as well as. And what you learn is you, you really can't BS our fans. Um, you know, I talk to counterparts at, at other teams um, around the NBA and sort of pick their brains a little bit on what they're doing. Um, and some of it relates to us, some of it doesn't. But, um, you know, you, you need to be authentic with your fan base and you need to be straightforward with them. And um, you can't really hide from what you are. And, you know, it's – Fans, you know, especially in this marketplace, will will call you on it in an instant. Um, you know, if you're trying to carry a message through to them that's that's not authentic, um, they'll they'll hit you right back with it. Um, and especially, you know, in the days of social media, there's there's no hiding on those fronts. Yeah, you touched on an, another question I had. Is is more like we've got the beloved teams of Boston, and we are a sports nation here in New England. Um, what are the challenges in such a passionate fan base and, and the, those diehards? What are some of the challenges that you face associated with, with the marketing and the branding of your teams? You know, I, I just say it's, it's 24-7, 365. I mean, there's really no, um, there's no off seasons for, for any of the teams. Um, there's, you know, there's fan blogs now. There's, you know, two sports radio stations. There's, you know, CSN, Nesson. Um, you know, ESPN covers things. There's, I mean, it's, it's going all the time. Um, social media, you know, our players are on social media, which I'm sure, you know, Matt dealing with the players, you know, loves. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's people, you know, in today's day and age, they, they want sports as an outlet and they want content. And, you know, we deliver great content, but it's instant feedback all the time. Um, and really, no matter where you go or, or where you're where you're at, you're always getting that that feedback. Uh, the only thing I would add to that, I think, <clears throat> and sort of similar to what uh, what these guys said uh, a couple minutes ago, but I think it's hard, especially when you're talking about the clients we work with on the on the partnership side. Um, a challenge is being tremendously authentic compared to what they're doing with their their team partners in other markets. You know, I think, you know, here you have to be. You know, you can't get lost in sort of the hokey nature of some things companies do with teams in other markets. And it works for them, and it's great. But I find myself having a conversation all the time. I'm a big yes guy. I say yes all the time, pretty much all day, personally and professionally, which is a whole separate panel, I'm sure. But, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I find that where I struggle the most is when we're talking you know, to companies where we, we have relationships with who might have 20 other team deals. 
we are literally the outlier in what we sort of say yes to and what we say will work. And, and I'm really, really honest with, with people. And, um, you know, again, it does pain me to, to tell a client uh, no to something or to sort of say, well, this is why it won't work. But a lot of the things that do maybe move the needle in other markets just don't don't move the needle here. Uh, and it's certainly not just about Fenway Park being 105 years old. I and mean, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about the garden. We're talking about things that you like. I mean, it's all a little different from game presentation to how brands are reaching out to fans. And, you know, we're very lucky with a lot of the clients we work with. They've been with us for quite a long time. And they sort of now understand the marketplace. Uh, and they realize what we're telling them is actually true. We're almost saving them from themselves. But I do think you have to fight the urge a little bit to sort of do some things that might, be a tiny bit hokey and just realize the sort of fan base you're you're trying to sort of mark certainly market to, but also your your you know your your clients are marketing to because they're ultimately an extension of of your brand. You know, I mean, if so, if if a program is ridiculous in the marketplace, it's a, a poor reflection on both you know uh, a Bank of America and the Red Sox or yeah. someone else. So I think that's a challenge. Yeah, Matt, yeah. Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I think that the other challenge is that it it at times your own sports operation side can even make it difficult on you in our marketplace because you can't hide behind things because your fans are so knowledgeable about it. Meaning like if you're going through a rebuilding phase or if you're retooling or if they're doing things that aren't popular from you, the sports operation side for like for us, the hockey operation side, sometimes that makes our jobs, I think, more complicated in this market where in other markets they can probably fool the fan base a little bit more or, or you know direct conversation a little bit more. Whereas we don't have that ability, I think the conversation is oftentimes driven by the fan base itself. And I, I would say from sort of the fan marketing standpoint, sort of bouncing off what Troop said, for us, I mean, the passion makes us all better, but it also makes us think a lot more. And um, which is, we would take that for a variety of reasons, but experimenting definitely is a little bit more challenging here because the market is so strong than it is in other other areas. You don't just sort of throw a promotion and say, hey, maybe maybe it'll work. You know, you have to really think through the the um, the elements of, of like for example, years ago we didn't do any giveaways and there was a lot of talk within the organization of well this is, Boston fans don't like giveaways. And because of how sometimes cynical, how passionate, how knowledgeable, sort of some of it becomes um, as much of sort of like you don't take it. Uh, the, I think fans, or the perception of us at times is that fans take this so seriously that they're not always having fun. And at the end of the day, you know, we went back and forth and said, you know, at the end of the day, like fans would rather have a bobblehead than not want to have a bobblehead, even though they are passionate and they all, they, they know seemingly everything about what's going on. And so I think we have, and I think that's changing too. I think the market hasn't, I, I think the market is as strong as ever, but I think f what fans want at a game, um, and you know, we all sort of have different game experiences depending on if you want to a Bruins or a Celtics or a Red Sox game, but, um, but there is the fun element of it that we, I think we're all trying to balance with sort of the, the sport of being a fan as well. Yeah, and talking about that a little bit more uh, as far as the fun part of it, being social and being at the game, we know that everyone's on their phones during these games. How are you engaging um, new technologies and social media platforms to, to help keep that conversation engagement going with your fans? Um, and is and are you considering the ROI of each time that you're having to do that on social media? I'll, ju I'll jump first. Um, <laughs> give Troops some more time. To I think. still have a BlackBerry, so I, I really don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to sit this one out. I don't know. A, a good example I'll give you is like the Atlanta Hawks just did a, a Tinder night where they were swiping left, swipe swipe right night. I don't know if you guys have yeah. heard of that. But so good examples of new innovative went. ways. <laughs> <laughs> Blackberry, no swiping. <laughs> so many jokes. So much, huh? <laughs> um, no, but go, uh, just jumping back to social and, you know, in the fan experience, it, you know, at NBA meetings, God, probably five years ago, I remember, you know, Mark Cuban got up and spoke and he talked about not wanting, um, he wanted fans focused on the court and, you know, on, on what he was putting out there on the court and, didn't want them going to their phones and you know then the world started to change you know so much more and now we, you know I look back you know ironically the other day because um, we're starting to plan out some stuff for our 10-year um, anniversary of winning the OA championship 
and you know when we were getting ready to win like nobody had their phone out like I was expecting to to look and see like oh everybody's got their phone out taking pictures and I'm like oh that's right like that that didn't exist at that point of people taking you know yeah. bringing their phone out and taking pictures and it's amazing how much it's changed and you know I look at um, the way different fans experience our games now and you know for the most part when there's a break in play like everybody goes right for their phone um, and everybody's taking pictures and everybody wants to share. You know, the Garden um, a year ago did a great job, you know, with the infrastructure and improving the Wi-Fi because that in surveys with our fans, that's that was really important to them in terms of the game experience. They wanted to be able to connect, um, you know, with with others that weren't at the game with them, you know, instantaneously. And they didn't want, you know, a slow load for their picture or their for, for their video. Um, you know, the biggest thing for us, you know, the last couple of years and, you know, we're jumping into it much more this year. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we've done stuff with Facebook and Twitter, but now it's, you know, for the younger fans, especially they, they want Snapchat filters. Um, and so, you know, we've looked, you know, the, the, the one thing we do on the marketing front and with content, especially, um, in digital is, you know, we'll meet on a weekly basis and we'll have, you know, 13 different people from all different aspects of the organization and a lot of younger people on our staff because they've grown up with the apps and they've grown up with social media. And, you know, for us being, you know, older, you know, 40, 50 year old men trying to make decisions on, you know, what we should do with social media. I mean, that's just not going to, you know, we can steer the conversation. Um, but, you know, having younger people involved on, on the social media has been a, a huge impact for us. How about you guys? Well, I think feel the same way. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that teams have is, is deciding where that content should go. And like, so you have all this content that, that you control, and is deciding which is best told by yourself and which is best pitched to external media or trying to get external media to cover. And then when you use it yourself, where do you use it? Do you use it on you know, for the Bruins? We have a couple TV shows and then we have ownership stake with the Red Sox and Nesson. So does it go to Nesson? Does it go on our own social media? So it's, it's figuring out, you know, where is that content going to engage most with our fan base? How can we, if we can monetize that content? Um, I think those are all questions that we ask ourselves every day to Sully's point and with the landscape just constantly changing, um, with social media and broadcast rights and, you know, now with our, like we were talking about earlier, our BAM relationship now that we have. I mean, it's just, it's constantly changing, constantly evolving. So I think the key for me would be to be nimble as a staff and not to get so rigid that you, you lose sight of opportunities as they come. With that, though, are you adopting standardizations of those thought processes or are you just sort of reacting to the landscape? I don't think you can adopt the standardizations just because I think it changes so much so often and so quickly that I think if you if you do, you're going to miss opportunities. I, I think that perhaps that that thinking is changing and has changed recently. Um, I think probably if you were to talk like five years ago, like you're talking about, there was probably that thought that you can be more rigid and define it like this content needs to go here and this needs to go here. And this is the specific voice that we need to have here. All the time. But now it changes so quick. I mean, you look at, you know, a year and a half ago, Snapchat, I, probably the four of us would have no idea what that is. And now we're all thinking about Snapchat, right? Or like people are thinking about Snapchat at our businesses. So I, I, I just think you have to be nimble in, in the way you think about these things and, and constantly thinking about new ways to engage and monetize through those channels. Yeah, I would, I would say for us, like those, the, the content meetings that we have, you know, it's typically a two hour meeting, you know, every Monday. Um, you know, with those 13 people. And th that's probably where we have our most heated debates on what to do with the content and where to put it and who owns what. And again, like, you know, is, is stuff, you know, can we sponsor certain stuff or, you know, if, if will that be dragged down? Like if we put it on, on Facebook with a logo. It takes away that authenticity. That Not necessarily the authenticity, but just like, you know, Facebook, um, Facebook's very good at, at sort of setting the hook and then getting you to bite and then changing the rules. Um, in terms of like the algorithms they'll, they'll put out there. So again, yeah, yeah, I mean, we definitely need to be nimble just because things and rules and, you know, the platforms are, are changing, you know, and I think Instagram is going to go the same way, obviously being owned by, by Facebook and you can see sort of what they're starting to do. So, um, you know, that, the, um, the planning that we go through, we literally have, you know, every, every week, 
you know, is mapped out and every day within that week and, you know, each piece of content and, you know, we have a player by player plan um, of what content we want to get out on each player and what content we want to give to the player to be able to put out on their own, things like that. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a Script, lot. A little bit scripted. Yeah. And then you even look like at Twitter and like with the broadcast now going on Twitter of, of the NFL and like how that conversation's next to that. the, mm-hmm. next to the broadcast and, and how that engages fans is completely different than the way that that that, that tool and that that social media outlet you worked before that. So even you're monitoring with, what's next of the content. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think in, um, for us, it's, it's these guys were describing. It's an ever changing world. Um, the core principles don't really change. You know, at the end of the day, it's about how we're connecting with fans, how we're getting the stories out that we that we want. Um, most of them that we want, and um, but and, and trying to figure out for us especially because we have so many home games, that's always the main focus, and it's the biggest focus for our fans. When we when something happens big at Fenway Park, our social metrics are going to go and be larger. You know, the, the, like, I remember years ago when when T- Veritech retired, it was a big deal, and you know felt like a big deal instinctively and then you'd say go on social and say that's a big deal when we won the world series in 2013 that felt like a really big deal and you know what it was a really big deal on social and so the the metrics and sort of the roi i mean it usually dovetails with what is what you would naturally think of as a fan in sort of these these iconic moments or these big moments um and we're in the same boat what we've tried to do structurally and i think this is the challenge for all organizations sports and others is just you know how do you structure teams around this ever-changing world of social media and and you know you have to be incredibly nimble so the barriers and standardization has to get completely thrown out and sort of the what you look for as it relates to traits of different teams that work on the day-to-day of content and social media change as well so something that we did well, last year was you know photography videography graphic design are now all under one roof you know and again three four five years ago they were all had different uh, different focal points you know if you're a photography it was mostly about you know day to day just getting the players and also looking at what we're doing for our Red Sox magazine you know that's changed dramatically so if something happens and Mookie Betts hits three homers in Baltimore okay, we'll get the highlight of it, but there's got to be, you know, a GIF that we create. There's got to be other content that we create immediately to complement, again, what those apex points are throughout the season or throughout a game. And, you know, everything that we do now, you've got the main focus, but then you've got this core team that tries to get and, and augment those, those special moments and connect with fans, especially younger fans uh, that are so important to the next generation of, of our industry. So with that in the world of social media for 10 plus years and what you've learned, what are the pitfalls that we're, that we know to avoid and how are we avoiding them with, with young teams and, and folks that are, you know, very familiar with all these social media sites? How, how are we as organizations and brand protectors figuring out how to That'll be one for Sully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say, you know, with our, um, you know, with our guys, especially the younger guys, that are coming in, you know, they're, they're going to, you know, college for a year or two and then, you know, coming right into the NBA. Um, for us, it's just communication and education. You know, I think they're, they're told a lot of these things in college. Um, but then when you hit a bigger stage, there's bigger audiences attached to it. And, you know, we've, we've hit some stuff with some of our guys, you know, putting stuff out on social media and it's, you know, it's a quick call and say, you know, Hey, you know, we got to think about this. Um, you know, Sometimes when these guys are like 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, you know, I think back to when I was, you know, that age and thank God social oh, media didn't exist, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that was that's a why, long time ago. <laughs> that's why Troop's still on the Blackberry. That's, that's right. Black but, and white TV. But, yeah, I think, you know, like anything, it's communications, conversations with them, um, you know, and just understanding, again, with their age, that's the world that they live in. Absolutely. And Troop, how do you handle that with your partners? Uh, well, I think, uh, it's, it's certainly a lot more controlled, you know, with, with, with our partners. I think, I think it's truly, um, a struggle for a lot of, um, the companies we do business with to sort of crack the, the code on the, on the social side. I think they look to us to really help them. Um, and truly, and I'm not just saying this cause he's sitting up here, but, um, you know, 
Adam and his team have done a really great job kind of being able to sort of mold some programs that our partners can get behind because I think they're still a little confused on how they can truly be authentic in that space uh, and provide messaging that people really care about. So um, I don't know that we police it, but uh, but a few years ago, it was really hard for us to sort of direct them to what the right move was. And, I, and I'm not kidding. I still do have a BlackBerry. I, I love my BlackBerry, and I'm not at all advanced uh, on this stuff. So my I feel like I'm completely unprepared and not creative when I'm talking to partners about sort of this avenue. Um, and and Grossman and his team have done a great job sort of being able to push the firms. Because, again, I think they're saying, you know, they don't they may know how to reach kind of their customers, but they're sort of looking to us, say, how do you reach kind of the common the common customer? Um, so we, we, we try to help them when we can. How about your um, decided outreach to the millennials, right? That's the next generation reach to everybody is seeking these, these this group. Um, what are you doing? What, how are you attracting them and trying to keep them? And, and do you think you are doing a good job doing it? Yeah, I would say for us, it's, it's really, um, it's the video content. You know, the, the younger fans want to consume as much video as they can. That's why, you know, I frankly was surprised when the NFL went the route that they did in terms of sort of banning the teams from, you know, being able to put out their own highlights because that's, that's what the younger fans want, um, you know, and I sometimes, you know, I have, I have two boys, one's 16, one's 13, and they'll have all their friends over, and I sort of, you know, I'll watch the way that they consume a game. Um, and Focus groups. Yeah, and, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch, though, because, you know, on Sundays, you know, I'll sit there and I'll want to watch an entire Patriots game. There'll be 10 kids in our house, and they're all, you know, they've got different TVs on on red zone and they're checking their, you know, on their phone, they're checking their fantasy team. And, you know, when the Celtics are on, you know, for a road game, I'll be sitting there watching that game. And, you know, I'll say to my 16 year old, who's a basketball player, I'm like, Hey, do you want to watch this game? And, or I'll say, Hey, if he's doing his homework, I'll be like, Hey, you got to check this play out. And I'm like, come downstairs, I'll rewind it. And he's like, oh, I already saw it on, you know, Instagram, or I saw it on somebody's Snapchat story. And, you know, they, they, the days I think of them sitting down and watching a, a full game, doesn't necessarily um, exist. So I think the challenge for all of us is going to be to continue to, to get the eyeballs, um, to, to put the hooks in them as fans, um, and to get them to want to continue to come out to the games. Um, you know, I think, again, if you're, if you're sort of born and raised in this marketplace, you're, um, you know, the, the fan is almost in your DNA to a degree. Um, and we just need to make sure that we're, we're taking the right steps to make that continue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's content. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like, there's different content for, for different demographics, for different ages, and, and different uh, mediums to, to use that content to connect with your fans. And I think that's really what it comes down to. It's figuring out where the millennials are going to be versus where is the fan that's sitting at home watching, you know, a road game on Nesson. Like, where are those guys going to be? And, and I, you know, I, it goes back kind of to my answer earlier. Like, it's being nimble and it's trying to understand that fan base as they grow and as they change. And, you know, like, at one point that, that younger age group was on Facebook and Twitter, and now that younger age group is on Snapchat. And in three years, that younger age group is going to be on something that we all don't know about who's sitting up here. And, We're on House and, Party. Yeah. Who here has heard of House Party? <laughs> Different panel, Sully. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Apologize. Yeah. But more. Adam, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So a couple, I'd say a couple things. One is there is this growing debate um, that's going on between sort of marketing and monetization. And yeah. I think that's, that's, yeah. that's really what's interesting. So with what's going on with the NFL, and they're trying to monetize every bit of video content that they, they can. Um, which is a, it's a strategy. It just it does come at a cost from a marketing standpoint. The same thing, you know, baseball has that as well, and every business has those trade offs that you have to make. Um, we, you know, the, the NBA, I think, is in many ways kind of been the most open um, to make to sort of having the philosophy of looking at the video um, in on digital channels and feeling like it could complement and and actually enhance either ticket sales or the live broadcast and on traditional sources so um so i think that's something to monitor and and you know it's it's it is a really fascinating dynamic that's taking place with with 
sort of these hegemons of, of Google and Facebook. And, um, you know, when we were, we went to Facebook over the summer and as Sully was saying, I mean, their whole drive is for video. You know, the, the written word is, is starting to become an endangered species and, you know, on Instagram and on Facebook and, and obviously with, with Snapchat, um, there's, there is just this growing compulsion to create more video and consume more video, um, which will have an enormous effect on, on, the game experience um, I think in the arena and in the ballpark, and then also with the traditional broadcast outlets. But I think the other piece on the millennial side, because every time we talk about millennials, sort of, we always automatically talk about the digital space, which makes a lot of sense because of all the the data or the the content that's being consumed. But the other thing for us is just we have to continue to think about what we're doing in park because the business for all of us is trying to how do we drive fans to our venues. And you know, part of that is through new experiences, new group out opportunities, new group settings, um, and just again, sort of this idea of fun. I think there's the the definition of fun for a millennial is obviously different than a, a season ticket holder. It's been you know, had season tickets since um, for the last thirty years, and that dynamic's always tricky too to try to figure out how you're you you know you you've got a core fan, but a, perhaps an aging core fan, and how do you create unique experiences that both want without denigrating the brand um, and what we're doing. So, like as an example. This year, we're actually creating um, in the deep right field area a new sort of bar and kind of communal space where there were some you know, it was tough sections for us to sell. Creating those group spaces, creating those group areas are so important for, um, you know, for communities. Because I think from a millennial standpoint, they do want to go to events with groups. Um, and, they, and it's not just traditionally saying, okay, well, we've got 10 tickets. Let's all sit in a row. It's like we want to hang out and we want to be at an event. We want to be at a game, but we kind of want to do it on our own terms. And sort of those terms are starting to change too. And I think you'll see arenas and, and ballparks adapt to that uh, going forward. So we'll move on to sort of the concept of winning and losing. How how is it in a you know from season to season, good, bad, ugly season sometimes? How does that change what you're doing and marketing and all of these things that we've already considered? Well, I think it it, okay. it forces you in some ways to to focus on the in game experience like we were just talking about. I think those are the things that we can control. Like when you talk about a game in particular, like and, and people coming to your venue to watch and paying, like you need to provide them, you know, with the ticket prices that we all charge and, and how expensive it is for a family to go. Like you need to provide a, a positive experience for fans of all ages when they come into your venue. And you, that's what you need to try to do that. Like even though a loss is, is going to make it harder for them, they still need to provide an experience that, that they can look back on fondly and want to go to again. I mean, that's like, it's the number one thing is when they leave your venue at the end of the game, you you want a fan to to want to come back and want to do it again, despite the the outcome. And I think that's that's the hardest part of our job, right? Like anybody could be a marketer for a team that wins all the time. I mean that that'd be easier, significantly, obviously. Like that. Be <laughs> <laughs> fine. No, but I but I agree. I mean, you know, we we sort of plan, um, or you know, what we talk about is, you know, we we don't control any aspect of what takes place, you know, on the court. Um, so we need to plan to, you know, deliver on on what Matt was saying that, you know, from sort of the driveway to driveway experience that, you know, from the moment they leave their house till um, till they return to their house, like every step along the way, we're trying to deliver a great night for them. You know, so whether you know, because from a ticket sales perspective, you know, what we try to do is move people up the ladder. So it's, you know, if we can get them to one game, we feel that, you know, we could get them to three games. Then if the next year they buy three games, let's get them to six games, six games to 12, 12 to a half season, half season to a full season, and sort of look at it, you know, on that, on those terms. Um, but you can't, you can't just go into seasons just saying like, all right, let's, you know, we're, we're going to be great on the court. Like, here's what, here's what we're going to do. Cause you never know with, Anything that can happen in the season, whether it's trades, injuries, you know, things of those nature, what, what direction the team's going to go. Um, you know, so we always, you know, to, to echo what Matt was saying, we always plan, you know, just, you know, take the game itself out of the out of the equation. And, you know, don't don't think about it in wins and losses, but, you know, the, the experience that you're giving to, to that fan to then in turn get them to come back. I think when I was in Miami, it was interesting. The NFL did a branding project with us, and 
the CMO of the NFL at that time said, you have to approach every year as if you're going to be 500. You know, even if you think you're going to be 13 and three or three and 13, you have no clue. And that was a, it, it was a great little sounding board, especially in the NFL when you really, you, when you, when you don't know. And I think we've tried, cause we've had years where we thought we were going to be great and it didn't quite end up that way. And to sort of, you can't go out with campaigns that in two weeks you've got to pull back because you have a slow start. Um, and so, so that's, that's one piece. I mean, for us, we're very fortunate. Uh, our ownership group was the, the one ownership group when the team was up for sale that wanted to save Fenway. Um, you know, when, when, and it's, a unique and iconic and historical place and we we don't take that for granted and especially we don't take it for granted when the team's not doing as well because that is the biggest asset that we have the most consistent asset that we have is is the ballpark um, and then the other piece I'd say and, and troop really for our organization epitomizes this but customer service and is is paramount and you know as matt was saying we can't control the wins and losses but the the idea that you know anyone that comes through um you know should get unparalleled service um and make sure that they feel like they are a part of the family whether it's a corporate partner or whether it's a first time um fan to fenway park those we believe there's you know it's hard to measure frankly, because team performance and, you know, we talk about measurements and winning helps. Um, you know, that's a great ROI. You get a great <laughs> ROI on winning. But the, the we do believe in service and sort of micro-marketing, treating fans as individuals. And we think over the course of time that will pay off and, and sort of hope will ride the waves um, for of, of the wins and losses. Troop, how about you? How does that affect your partnerships? I know you generally sign long-term deals. That's why. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm a, a firm. I mean, it's it's a lot easier for me to say this being in the market around with the organization we're with, but um, uh, we try to make it not about wins and losses, right? I believe um, companies that are doing long-term deals with sports teams, I mean, it, I just think it's ridiculous if they're doing it based on wins and losses. Um, now, I think in some markets, that's why. I think people will look at, look at the deck and be like, okay, um, I think the Indians are going to be good this year. We'll do a one-year deal. And I think a lot of teams will take it. I, I kind of think if you're going to truly um, partner with someone, I mean, you, you've got to certainly take a couple of years to understand if, if the partnership works. I think if you can win a ton of games together, that's unbelievable. And make no mistake, if you lose all your games, it probably makes less sense for them to, to be with you. But um, they're not um, – it's just not all about what happens on the field. And I think obviously, as Adam said, oh, of course, your numbers are better, fan metrics are better, business is better if you're winning all your games. But from a sponsorship and partnership perspective, if you're doing all the right things, if you're treating them well, if the brand is represented correctly in the marketplace um, and the relationship is strong, um, you know, it's no different than, I mean, I always say it's sort of like or the way we look at our partners, it's like a marriage. I mean, it's like thick and thin, you know, there, there are a lot of companies that go through tough times. We stand by our partners and they stand by us. And, you know, we had some, some really bad years over the last few years where, you know, we were just sort of always seem to be finishing last place. And, um, there were, um, you know, there would be stories that were written about, you know, the, the, for some reason about the sponsorship business, you know, that's going to go down. That's going to be terrible. They're going to start losing sponsors and partners and, I, I only took offense to it because I was like, what a short-sighted view. Like, why do you think companies spend as much money as they spend, certainly with us and other teams, to just go in and then take off? Like, it just doesn't make sense. And and it was it was actually sort of nice when those articles would come out because we would have partners call us being like, you know, we're going to call the Herald and, and be like, why would we do that? You know, if, at JetBlue, we've had a tough year and, you know, when everything gets stuck on the runway and stuff, but our customers come back. You know, we have to earn it every day. And it's, a, it's about much more than that. So, um I certainly think on the on the business side, I mean, you need to win more than you lose uh, all the time, and I think that'll be better for you. But on the partnership side, I think if you're doing right by your partners and you're generating value and you just generally are are, are good partners, it seems pretty simple, um, they shouldn't be leaving you when the team's bad and, and coming back when the team's good. And I just don't think that's a smart business decision. You know? Absolutely. Uh, so control what you can control, the experience, driveway to driveway. What is, how do you determine, to your point, like those brands that are going to be those good long-term partners? What's the most important contributor to a strong brand? Well, I, I mean, you sh I mean, it's, uh, it would be great to be able to just sort of pick and choose who we do business with, and that's how it goes. Uh, unfortunately, it's not how it goes, but, um, you know, I think 
you, you certainly want to be doing business with folks that have strong ties locally. I think that's important. I think the messages line up better. I think um, for us, really historic New England companies, when we, when we all arrived 15 years ago, that was kind of our goal was to build our client base with really significant old school companies. If it works out, I mean, I think that's a perfect world scenario. We were very lucky to get a lot of sort of, you know, New England companies that really you don't see other places, whether it's the FW Webs or the at the time, at least, the W.B. Masons or the Granite City Electrics. I mean, these are companies that don't do sports deals uh, outside of New England, you know. And when you look at the EMCs and the State Streets, they're just – now, they're, they're big local companies, and, and they're doing business with us for, for various various reasons, but you don't see them other places. So we that, we like that. Um, again, it takes more than just saying, you're here, we're here, let's do a deal. I mean, that clearly isn't the way it goes. But um, we got lucky. I think, you know, how, how brands – you know, position themselves and what makes a, a strong brand. I think it actually circles back to what, what these guys all truly do. I mean, it's if they have a strong sort of marketing platform. I mean, you know, I'll use a company like W. Mason. When we started, I mean, they were a, a small, small, pretty small company. Uh, we weren't, you know, totally clear on kind of how big they were, how, how good they were, how strong they were. Now they're, you know, it's a $2 billion plus company. You see them in every, a ton of different ballparks. Um, they've become very strong, but part of their reason in partnering with us was they wanted to be held to a higher standard, they wanted people to think, quite frankly, perception-wise, that they were a lot bigger than they were. Um, so we get a lot of that. We get companies saying, "Listen, if we can, you know, if we can do deals with, I mean, I'm sure certainly all these, all our teams, but um, deals with the Red Sox, it, it, you know, customers look at us maybe a little bit differently." Um, so I think sports spending with companies, it, it's 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 truly a, a a hardcore marketing play. You have to buy into it to say, if I can get tap into the passion of sports fans. It's going to help my brand. Um, and I think you find more smaller companies now getting involved because they really want a share of the voice and they want to, um, you know, very quickly get out in front of people and say, no, we're, he we're here. We're important. We're at Fenway Park. We're at the Garden. We're at Gillette Stadium. So um, I just think you have to be, you know, willing to take a chance with, with, with sports teams. Um, and I think the world's changing in that regard as well because things are, you know, people now are focused more on social and digital stuff. So, um but it's 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 becoming, I think, a uh, a tricky world on the sports side. But again, this panel it would be much different panel in Tampa, you know, um, or in in Cleveland, you know. And that's what's so why we're so lucky to be in the market we're in and and have the companies we have and really have the fan bases and teams we have. So I have time. We have time for one more question. Um, given that Northeastern is hosting this wonderful event, we want to talk about uh, what advice each of us would give to uh, someone starting out on a similar career path. What do we tell them as they're out there networking and aspiring to be in your seats in, the, in 10, 20 years from now? And uh, what should they be? What publication should we be reading? Or what should we know from the experts? Let's we'll start, Matt. The expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I would say probably be willing to do anything like to start and, and, and to take any position and to, in any sport and, and to work at it and be willing to listen and to learn kind of as you go. I, I think that's a big part of it. I think our, our industry, um, and I've, I've only worked in the sports industry, so I don't know if it's unique to ours or not, but it is certainly one that <clears throat> you, you can't get this experience elsewhere in other industries. So I think a lot of it is learning as you're there. So, so be willing to take a chance on, on any position you can get and then make the most of it when you get there and learn from the people who are around you, no matter what you're doing. I think I would tell anyone that wants to be in the sports that the, um, to go after it as hard as possible in terms of developing the network that, because there's not, if you, you know, say, hey, I want to be a doctor, then you're going to go to med school, you want to be a lawyer, you go to law school. It, there's no, there's no, on ramp, there's no defined on ramp to get into the sports industry, and um, but I think the at least for, for me, what was great, I think even if I hadn't set foot at Fenway Park, I think the people that I met and sort of part of the process of trying to break in was worth the exercise unto itself. And one of the things we talk a lot about, and you know, Troop and I have been working together more or less for 15 years, and we started. When we were really young, but I think now, as we're sort of middle-aged um, in the sports world, BlackBerry, <laughs> BlackBerry, um, you know that you just you see a different, you see people coming in differently, and a lot of that can be because of technology and just it's, it is sort of it feels like a little bit of a different generation. I think part of that is, you know, 
like establishing a, a relationship and a connection is not inviting somebody to LinkedIn. You know, like that's 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 not the same as making you know ten phone calls and trying to get five minutes with somebody. You know, that exercise is very different. And um, I think they said in and of itself, it's worthwhile to go through that. But kind of the dogged nature that you have to have will bear fruit even if you don't get into the into the sports industry. Yeah, you know, I would um, just add to that that, you know, I see so many, you know, young people coming out of school right now. Um, you know, and this happens for us internally too where, you know, they're in their first job and then – within like weeks to, you know, a month, they're already saying like, what's next for me? And my advice to people is, you know, whether it's in school, it's an internship, it's your first job, like always be great at what you're currently doing. And that's going to open up the, the other doors for you. Um, I think if you're always so focused about like what your next two or three steps are down the road, you're, you're, you know, it's going to have an impact on what you're, you're currently doing and what your current focus is. Um, and I think, you know, again, with social media to a degree, you know, what, what these guys were talking about is that, you know, you need to be able to communicate. You know, I, I interview kids coming out of school all the time for, you know, we have a big entry level sales program that we do. And, you know, you, you see hundreds of resumes and we bring, we bring kids in and, you know, the kids that, you know, some of the strongest resumes I've seen, the, the kids can't communicate. In terms, and what I mean by that is to sit in front of you and have a face-to-face -face conversation, um, where then you'll see some other resumes and you'll be like, "Yeah, you know what? I'll take a look at this." And then that person comes in, and their ability to engage and have a conversation and eye contact—it sounds like such simple things, but you get hit like you know within the first couple seconds of talking to somebody in the gut of like, "All right, this is somebody that I can have a conversation with," or. This is somebody that I could see working here, you know, and then that opens up the, the dialogue a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, I would say absolutely be, be willing to go for it. You know, if, if you want to work in sports, I mean, when I was back in college, there weren't really many, you know, schools with sports management programs. Now you see them literally everywhere. Um, and there's so many people that are trying to get into sports on a, on a you know, day-to-day -day basis. And then especially so many people is trying to get into sports in the Boston marketplace, I think because of, you know, the, the teams and, you know, what these guys are doing um, respectively for their brands. I mean, it's there, there's no um, it's no surprise to me that, you know, all all teams have won a championship, you know, within the last 10 years. I mean, it's it's this is a great sports market and people want to be here. But the level of talent that wants to be here is is sky high. And so, you know, if if I'm somebody coming out of school right now, I'm just, you know, and I want to work in Boston and I want to be here, like you need to keep going for it. Yeah, I mean, I, these guys just sort of nailed it. So it's awesome to go last on this one. <clears throat> um, I w the only thing I would add is I think you got to do your homework. I, I mean, I see a bunch of kids that are massively um, unprepared. Um, just in have no sense of what the organization does, what it's made up of. I, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I don't need people to know what I do. It's not really important, but I think you want to have a sense of what you're going for, uh, what you want to do and, and just get some background. And, and I, I, you know, I know when I was trying to get sort of crack into sports, that's all I did. I just, I just, you know, looked through as much information as I could about companies and teams and, executives and, and was extremely aggressive. And I think that's part of it because I do think you make your own luck. Um, and I would also say in the end, I mean, sort of Matt said it and I think everyone's kind of touched on it, but um, you really not only have to be willing to do anything, but whatever you're doing, just, just, just have faith that if you, if you're really pushing it and you're truly are working, you know, and putting hundred percent, cause I think everyone says I'm killing it right now. Like, I mean, are they like? I think you know. I think you know when you are, and you know when you're not. And and I'm fine with it. But but I, you know when you leave work and you're like, I nailed it, and you when you're like, kind of nailed it in maybe. And so, I think you know, just just have faith. If you're you know scrubbing the locker room floor at the garden, like, be the fastest at it, be the best at it, and just keep doing that and keep your head down. And someone will notice that, and someone will then put you in a different spot. I think it's when you become. I just see a lot of kids, are, they're, they're like, what? I mean, to Sully's point, they want something else or there's a little more entitlement. And I just think that may work in other businesses, certainly. And, and what, like Matt, I mean, I've only worked in, in sports, but, um, you know, I always think sports was like, to me, at least like a really tough college. Like it's really hard to get into, but it's not hard to stay. Um, and so 
you just have to buy into that because I mean I have I have folks on my team who and I will tell people this who started as you know security guards in Fort Myers and they weren't doing that because they wanted to be like police officers they did it because they were like I, I gotta I gotta figure it out I just gotta get in, in front of people and and they were picked out of it. Now they're, you know, uh, one of us running. The GM of the Diamondbacks. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, I mean, it's, 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 you, can, you can move around once you get in, but you got to get in. So I just think you have to be massively open-minded. And if you truly want to do it, um, sort of go, go for it. I mean, again, all cliche stuff, but it's certainly true. Can I add one thing? I know we're up against time, but the troop's point is if, if anyone gets an informational interview um, with anyone, like the, the, I think the worst question you can ask is, Tell me how you got started, or what's your career path been? Because it's such a waste of a, of time, yeah. knowing that there's Google, and you know, if you've got ten minutes, like make the most of the ten minutes that Adam you have. hates people clearly. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, that's great advice. Let's open up uh, to the audience for some questions. Over here, uh, we're gonna hold on one second. We're gonna get a microphone to you. Hi, uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, the television viewing pattern uh, as seen by the NFL this year. Average uh, viewing, you know, none of your NFL, obviously, but viewership is down 15%. I think in the NBA, it's it's down maybe 2 or 3%. MLB was obviously up with the Cubs. Um, are you concerned this kind of heralds a big change in uh, viewership and the, the, the uh, impact it's going to have on the next contract negotiations, particularly uh, given uh, you know, what's happening with sports nets, MSG, ESPN, losing the number of subscribers? I'll just say from, from our standpoint, I mean, well, what concerns us about the, the TV viewing experience, let's just take baseball, obviously. It's a, it's a, you know, there's a lot of, and you guys I'm sure read about this, there's a lot of pace of play issues in baseball, um, trying to make the game um, – you know, a lot faster, so people kind of stay and, and watch. Um, in fact, what's so interesting, we polled our fans, and our fans said make the games longer. Uh, so, we're, again, we're totally the anomaly uh, on this. But um, I think, yeah, I mean, we've said it up here for a little bit. I mean, games are viewed and, and consumed totally differently. So uh, I'm not necessarily as worried about uh, when you talk about sort of on the TV contract side, because I still think there's a lot of runway on, on that piece. But I do think we need to make – the games on TV, it's just got to be better. I think the broadcast has to be better. I think it has to be shorter. I think games have to start earlier. I have three little kids, and they're a disaster if they're up like an hour late. So like they just can't watch a, a World Series game that starts at eight o'clock. I mean, I understand it's not great from a TV revenue perspective to start in the afternoon on a weekend, but like get over it. You know what I mean? Like so, I think I think we need to, as a sport, baseball needs to to realize that because once you, I think you got to be careful once you start taking it for granted. Your toast, and and it, and we talk about all the time with the Cleveland Indians. You know, they sold out 455 straight. They were everything's great, and now like that it ended, and it ended. You know, because they were pretty comfortable with it. So I think I don't think you can get comfortable, and you have to be willing to change. I think the NFL has done a pretty good job of that, actually. Um, but uh, the, I mean, that's what concerns me the most because my kids won't definitely won't watch a whole game, similar to Sully's kids, but but I certainly won't watch a whole baseball game. But I think if the broadcast just was more fun, a little more interactive, uh, and the game you, you knew wasn't going to last four hours. Maybe you knew it was like two and a half. I think we'd be better off. Yeah, I would say on that too, yeah. I'll be interested in, over the course of the next couple of weeks to see what, where the NFL ratings go. Uh, you know, it's, it's probably maybe a stretch to blame it all on the election. Um, but then you look at like Sunday night's Pats game against the Seahawks, those ratings were off the charts. So, you know, was there potentially some fatigue, just some viewing fatigue with, you know, what everybody was consuming? Potentially. Um, you know, with the NBA, again, we'll see, you know, now that the election cycle is over, um, where the ratings go over the next couple of weeks. So, but I do think, you know, in terms of people leaving, um, you know, ESPN or, or trying to figure out um, the way that they're consuming these games now, you know, again, like, um, you know, the, my focus group of two, you know, when my boys do watch a game, they'll be they'll watch it on their phone. Um, and so it's it's just, you know, to, to Troop's point, we need to figure out what that broadcast experience needs to be for them. Because, um, you know, at the end, it's still – sports is still unbelievable content, um, and that's what people want to want to consume. Um, and so we just need to figure out, you know, pace of play. You know, even in the NBA, we're looking – you know, typically our games are two hours, 15 minutes – be great to get it down to two hours and just to be able to say to people like all right seven to nine that's your that's your viewing window um so 
I think it's it'll be interesting with the NFL from here on out, yeah. and and not. Be- I don't think because of the election, so like I said, there are a lot of elements that they have gone gone into the current ratings decrease. But you know, if the Super Bowl is way off, then that's a different deal. And I think yeah. that's where we're all in competition with other factors that um, for for sort of hearts, minds, and time of of all fans than we were ten or fifteen years ago. And so we were talking recently. That ratings in general, I mean, again, five years ago, you weren't streaming as much or if at, if at all for live content. You know, now you've got that capability, that ability. So I think the metrics will change in terms of sort of total live engagement um, as time goes on. Um, but but it will be interesting uh, for, for sure to figure out sort of what the dynamic is. And then also the big games are still the big games. Um, you know, the... The, the, the Cubs Indians World Series and just the fact that the Cubs were in that and the storylines those are going to be big big time games and just if you're a fan of sports at all because of the magnitude of that game you may watch that I mean just think about hey are you going to watch the game you're gonna have friends over you're gonna make an appointment television literally appointment television if it's a game in June you may still be interested but you're not if it's streaming on your phone, you may watch for a couple innings and still sort of do three or four other things, but you're not going to have 10 people over to watch that, that June game. And so I think what we're seeing now is just, you know, again, those, those bigger games are just be, have become, have become larger, but the ones in the middle have sort of, those are the ones that are not consumed in the, in the same way. And that's, that'll be interesting to track as time goes on. I think we also have to look at it as an opportunity and a responsibility to be good partners with our RSNs and and how we interact with them on on the local level for the local broadcasts. I think that um, we probably need to think more critically than we have in the in the past when, in regards to just like helping them with tune in support or whatever else. I think now we need to think about that content question earlier about what content do they have, how do they have, how do they distribute content on non-game days, how do they distribute content on their social channels around games to make it a robust, a more robust offering for the RSN. Um, that's kind of where I think we need to be a little bit um, more cognizant of that than we have in the past about how we work with our RSNs and being good partners to our RSN. Any others? One second, we'll get the microphone to you so everyone can hear. So the Celtics have done a great job of making the games more accessible for fans. I think the NBC Live app or whatever it's called, you can stream the game anywhere. Yep. Um, however, with baseball, you can't. So there's a blackout restrictions. Has there been any talk as far as maybe removing those and making the game more accessible on the, on the go? Because baseball does ask a lot out of you, and I would love to be able to stream it. Yeah, so that's a great question, and we um, we talk about streaming um, often, and uh, hopefully we're getting close to having that finalized. So which is good. Um, so that's key. I mean, that's it's been, and if you've seen how baseball's gone, it's it's been kind of a struggle, and a lot of it, you know, a lot of it's run through um, Tracy's old employer, yeah. I mean, just baseball <laughs> advanced media. So there's a, a lot of talks with the league, and so yeah, I mean, it's it's been a it's it's a little bit of a different setup in Boston with our relationship with Ness, and then then when you have sort of Fox affiliates and things like that. But um, it's heading in that direction, so I don't I don't think you'll have those issues too much longer. In the back there, yeah, it's just one and grab. Thanks. Uh, I have my uh, grandson, Matthew, here with us. Uh, he's a junior in high school, and he's looking at colleges. And I was just curious if you could very quickly give us a little bit of an idea of your educational background. And I know, Adam, you talked about, and, and Mark uh, both talked about the need to be aggressive and, and know what you want and go after it. But I'd just be curious as to how you guys got to where you are sitting up here. Uh, I... I uh, went to uh, I went to high school up here in Southboro, Mass, a place called St. Mark's. I went to college at uh, St. Lawrence University, upstate New York. Um, I always wanted to work in sports, so uh, get, well, every every uh, job I ever had since I was like 15 was somehow sports related. I felt like it was important to uh, build a resume that had kind of a <coughs> track on it um, that was that was sports. So I worked at the Olympics. I mean, all all internships, uh, a lot of unpaid stuff. Um, I worked on the agency side a bunch. Um, I worked at a network. Um, I mean, really just sort of tried every summer, every break, 
um, literally since early in high school, try, just trying to build that uh, and build contacts and networking. And ultimately, when I was able to break in, I, um, I really wanted to be an agent, uh, a sports agent. So uh, I worked with a, a guy who went to my high school who, who was a football agent. And uh, I, you know, kind of, you know, got a, maybe a leg up because we sort of had that relationship. So I think it's important to look at the alumni basis of, of where you're going to school. Uh, and that is how I broke in and I started out in the agency side. I, I didn't, I wasn't an agent cause I got a job and then I said no to it cause I was an idiot senior in college. Um, but then luckily still got a job at this agency. So it all worked out in the end, but that was a tough uh, week when I said no to that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, but I would say like, start to focus just on the industry. It's hard to know what you want to do. And it, it's, while it's a small industry, there's a lot of different facets, um, but try to tailor all your jobs sort of within the industry. Yeah. So I went to, um, I grew up in New Hampshire, went to Southern New Hampshire university. Um, for me at the time when I was trying to get internships with, you know, all the teams in, in Boston, I couldn't get a, you know, at the time it was like letter writing and, and making phone calls. And it wasn't getting either return. So it was literally just driving down to Boston and sort of knocking on doors. And a lot of people were like, go get out of here. Nope, not going to see him. But one day when I was down at the garden, and that's when the, the old Boston garden was getting ready to close, they had posted a, um, a, a, job, uh, a job posting for tour guides. And again, it goes back to the point of like, you know, being you know, willing to do anything. Really, it was not my dream to drive down from New Hampshire when I was in college on Fridays and Saturdays and give tours all day long at the Boston Garden. But I knew in terms of networking, that's how I was going to meet people. Um, and it, that's what led to you know, my first internship um, and then internship to a job. And you know, I would say you know, always treat people well because um, that's remembered, uh, whether you're a college student or you know, a, a young employee in, in the workforce. Um, you know, having that sort of attitude goes, you know, definitely goes a long way. The other thing I'd say too, if you're, if you are looking for internships, it's amazing the amount of people that um, just sort of wait. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm sure these guys get the, the calls and the emails too, to say, oh, do you have a, you know, an internship, you know, for the winter, or you'll get a call in May saying like, hey, you're looking for interns for the summer. Well, like right now, you know, it's, it's what, mid-November, we're looking for our interns for next summer. You know, so it's be out ahead of it um, and be proactive and don't don't wait or don't expect somebody to do it for you. I'm from Cleveland. Hold your applause. Um, <laughs> but um, and and yeah, yeah and, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I went to Duke University and so I, I was a public policy major. I never had a marketing class, um, and it's for us. We always feel like you don't need the direct. Like w once you get to an organization, then sort of the education begins. Um, so it's not in, in some areas. You know, if you're in finance or in IT, you need that track. And what what we do. We barely need an education, right? Um, do, do not. So, yeah, do not. Yeah, it actually sure. works against us at times. Um, but the 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 one. He's I, psyched. He's like, yeah, 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 right, 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 yeah, yeah. Why do we a tour guide if you're in? It's all over. Houseparty.com. So yeah. For me, I, I started. I started talking to the Indians, and um, that was my first. I, I never got in. I didn't get into the Indians. I was talking to the Colorado Rockies for a little. You know, I was trying to just get something, um, and and I thought my window was closed right after I graduated. And then you know, I went to a friend's lacrosse game and I started talking to her dad, and she said, you know, I don't know if I can do anything for you, but if you call me Monday, you know, my friend just became the CEO of the Red Sox and so like I didn't want to call you know it was like an awkward call to make because I didn't really know this guy that well but you know I called him on Monday and um you didn't really like his daughter I <laughs> she didn't like me yeah. that was the, that was the problem but I got the internship um and so but even then I mean this was at a time where I couldn't track anybody down like I remember calling um you know five or ten times and I actually became friends with the woman that I started to work with once I got in because 
sh- I couldn't get to Lakino. Lakino was the guy I was trying to get to, and I just couldn't get. And she, so I kept talking to Faye, you know, every couple weeks. And again, like it's they're awful calls to make. You know, you're sort of like, sort of hoping that no one answers, but you also <laughs> want somebody to answer. And um, but you also have to keep making making the calls and sort of keep keep pushing the the, the boundaries a bit. Yeah, I uh, I grew up in Taunton, Mass, and went to Holy Cross and was a political science major there. Um, kind of started to think that the career in sports might be something I wanted to do during my um, sophomore year, I think, or end of my freshman year. And I, I sent out, uh, I thought I wanted to either write about sports or work in sports PR. And uh, so I sent out, you know, cover letter and resume to, I think, every team in baseball, basketball, hockey, football, and Major League Soccer, and then pretty much every newspaper in every major city that there was. And I think I heard back from three people, only one of which was willing to give me an interview, and it was the New England Revolution. And I ended up doing a uh, an internship in their marketing and PR department. Um, that summer, my first day, I was in the Revolution mascot outfit outside of Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> like waving my waving the paw hand, you know? And that's, but that's that's what it is, and that's what it's about. And 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 for me, um, my college education, I, was, I hey, more people went through that drive-through than any Dunkin' Donuts. Did that Dunkin' Donuts, like it was unbelievable. But uh. You know, my college education for me was more about learning how to think critically, learning how to how to think on my feet and, and adapt to different situations. And I think um, I did a bunch of internships: Revolution, Patriots, Tennessee Titans, and, and and that like it was that was my education in sports. And then my my more formal academic education was was at school and kind of meshed those two. And and I still lean on that for my career. Bethany, we have time for more. Yes, one more question. Okay. Right here, you had yours. You guys talk about marketing in, in your off seasons, and I actually know this because I used to work for the Hawks. Um, you plan for the regular marketing seasons, but how do you guys plan? Because you don't know if you're going to make the playoffs. You know, in Boston, your fan base, okay, you have to make the playoffs. We all know that. And in 08, yes, we took you guys to seven and wasn't too happy down in Atlanta. But how do you guys, what's your different marketing plans that you have to put together knowing if we make postseason? Yeah, we'll start, you know, I don't want to say what we'll do this year, you know, not to jinx anything, but typically, you know, we'll we'll start to – we'll build out different scenarios probably in, like, December, early January and just say, like, all right, you know, which way are we tracking? How did things look? You know, we'll, we'll look at – you know, we'll work with, like – we've got a big analytics group, you know, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll ask for some indicators on what it's looking like and then just say, like, all right – you know, what, what are the storylines that we've seen so far? You know, because, again, like, we can plan for as much stuff as we want going into a season, but then, you know, each season takes its own storylines and goes in different directions. And then, you know, again, we'll, you'll tweak it in, in, you know, February, March, and then, you know, you, you have a pretty good idea in April of where it's going to go. And so then when April hits, because, you know, for us, the regular season ends on, like, a Wednesday – playoffs start that Saturday. So, I mean, you need to have everything already thought out and, you know, sort of be a well-oiled machine at that point to say, like, all right, if this if this goes this direction, here's what we're doing. If it goes here, this is what we're doing. Um, you know, so those those meetings will, will start pretty soon. We wait a long time. And, um, and, and like in 13, well, a couple of things. One is we'll try to do – on the sales side, I mean, we want to make sure that we capture the momentum for yeah. the following year for sales, and I think that's probably consistent. I mean, you just you have to bottle this and try to make sure that you elongate any successes um, as as you can in, into the next season. So that process starts for us probably around you know a couple months in advance if things are starting to look okay and say okay how are we going to um, use our messaging to make sure that we're we're riding this uh, this positive wave. But on the storyline side, you know, like in 13, we had beards and everyone grew a beard. And again, from, you know, it's like, oh, like, great marketing. It's like, I mean, if you imagine, like, I got in front of our players <laughs> in spring training and said, hey, guys, like, I got a great idea. You know, it's, it's, so what we do from a marketing standpoint is that 
we're sort of the crust of the of the pizza. You know, we just sort of say, okay, what's going on, and how can we kind of fan the flames of what is what what fans are excited about. So the head of social media for us at the time, we we met. I remember in in August, and she said, listen, people are digging the beards. Like, and it really hadn't become that big of a, th- a thing for us. I know in hockey, you know, playoff beards are playoff beards um for uh, and again like there's another idea stolen but we'll we'll take credit for it um and so the but the idea in august of saying hey you know the beards are going to be kind of our thing and he said well if we continue to be successful we're going to wait before we as an organization really glob on and start building out kind of the uh, further storylines around it. So we started, you know, we named them and we put graphics aside on them, but we, we purposely waited for the right time to do it because from, there's the organic qualities that can only come from players that sort of reach fans directly. Sometimes the teams themselves can kind of screw it up because it becomes a little bit more corporate or a little bit more, more taxing to the, um, to, to our fans. And it's not as cool. So there's a window of time when you can sort of pounce on that. And it, it coincides with uh, towards the end of the season when things are looking very successful. Um, and then we can sort of pile on and then do some pretty cool things around it, but it's gotta be the right time and the, the right narrative and hopefully with the right players. Yeah, I think, both guys kind of hit it on the head. I mean, from a sales perspective, our sales group is is planning earlier and they're getting out in front of things and, and for their sales cycle. From the marketing side, I think it's kind of a good bookend to the the beginning part of this conversation, which is the Boston fan wants that organic piece. They want to feel that connection to to the true and authentic team and the message that the team has. And I think probably with all the teams that have won championships, they're all unique in that they all have their little identifiable qualities that the Boston fans hook onto. And, and as a marketer, it's how do you, how do you then bridge that gap and connect the fans even more to those things? Like in 11, we won, it was the jacket that the guys gave out after every win in the playoffs, things like that, you know? So I think that that's really our job is to not screw it up because our teams are creating those memories and those moments. Our fans are smart enough and they're so knowledgeable and they want to connect to those moments how do we get out of the way and let that connection happen and, and maybe in certain ways facilitate it, but more so just don't screw it up. For sure. Great. So with that, I think I'm going to turn the podium back over to Bethany. So I just want to say a quick thank you to um, everyone for coming tonight, to Tracy, to Troop, Sean, Adam, and Matt. Um, it was a great event. Thanks, guys. This is our last circuits industry program of the – uh, year, but we will have more programming come uh, January, and uh, you can check our website for more networking, social, sports, events of all kinds um, if you're interested in uh, further continuing um, with your Northeastern uh, journey. So uh, there's food still. The bar is going to be open again, um, so continue to mingle, and thank you all for coming.